Ladies and gentlemen. This episode is sponsored by Advanced Skills Company, the official agent of JPI Healthcare in Iraq. I personally use the products of JPI Healthcare in my clinic for years now, and throughout the years, these products have been amazing in terms of providing excellent image quality at the lowest radiation dose possible, and they are durable, reliable, and efficient. I recommend if you are looking to establish your radiology practice, whether in a clinic, in a center, or in a hospital setting, to go to the JPI Healthcare website, see their products for yourself, and then call Advanced Skills Company if you are in Iraq, and these guys will provide the best possible solutions, whether in terms of hardware or software. I will leave the contact information in the video description, and don't forget to use the magic word highlights in radiology, because you will get a 10% discount on all JPI Healthcare products till the end of 2024. Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of Highlights in Radiology. In this episode, we are going to talk about an interesting pathology, which is fibrous dysplasia. Before we start, I want to remind you to subscribe, like, share, and tell your friends about us. This is Dr. Ahmad Dhaya Abdul Wahab, and this is Highlights in Radiology Season 2. Stay with me. Fibrous dysplasia is a developmental anomaly of bone formation in which there is an inability of bone forming tissue to produce mature lamellar bone, even if osteoid is produced. It cannot mature to lamellar bone. It's a benign developmental abnormality in which the medullary cavity is replaced with fibrous tissue. The fibrous tissue contains immature woven bone. It is seen in 1% of biopsized primary bone tumors, and it is the most common benign lesion of the rib. Other associated abnormalities include McQueen Albright syndrome, in which there is a polystotic unilateral fibrous dysplasia, endocrine abnormalities like precocious puberty, hyperthyroidism, also caffeine spots with female predominance. Other associated abnormalities include Mazabrot syndrome, in which there will be multiple fibrous and myxomatous soft tissue tumors in association with polystotic fibrous dysplasia. It is seen in patients from 5 to 50 years of age with peak incidence of 10 to 20 years with equal male to female ratio. It has two forms, either monostotic or polystotic fibrous dysplasia. The most common presentation in monostotic fibrous dysplasia is usually asymptomatic. It can present with pathologic fractures, painful stress fractures, Commonly in the femoral neck, this plastic callus formation can be seen after a fracture. While in polystotic fibrous dysplasia, two-thirds of patients are symptomatic by the age of 10. They may present with leg pain, limping, pathologic fractures, abnormal vaginal bleeding, also seen in about 25% of cases. Endocrine disorders like hyperparathyroidism, hyperthyroidism, diabetes mellitus, acromegaly, hypophosphatemic rickets, and McCohen Albright syndrome can be seen. On a clinical examination, we see hyperpigmentation of the skin, also called cafe au lait spots, which often corresponds to the site of skeletal involvement. Also, soft tissue myxomas, sometimes gerobism, which is an autosomal dominant symmetric involvement of the mandible and maxilla, can be seen. Lyontiasis osea can be seen. It's a form of craniofacial fibrous dysplasia in which there will be involvement of the facial and frontal bones, and the face of the patient resembles a lion, resulting in multiple cranial nerve palsies. We should know that there is no progression of monostotic to polystotic fibrous dysplasia. In monostotic form, the growth of the lesion usually stabilizes during puberty, and enlargement of the lesion can be seen during pregnancy, while in polystotic form, the lesions remain active after puberty. There is a risk of malignant transformation in about 0.5% into osteosarcoma, and less commonly into chondrosarcoma or fibrosarcoma. Regarding a treatment, asymptomatic lesions require no treatment, while symptomatic lesions can be treated by curettage and bone grafting of large lesions at risk for pathologic fractures. 
Note that the surgery with curettage is associated with high rate of local recurrence ranging from 20 to 100%. Also, straightening of angular deformities by grafting with cortical bones sometimes performed. Treatment of the underlying endocrine abnormalities is also indicated. Bisphosphonate can be given to decrease pain and prevent pathologic fractures, and it can lead to partial resolution of the lesions. So what radiology can offer in cases of fibro dysplasia? Well, first, we need to know the most common locations of fibrous dysplasia. The lesions usually involve the metadiaphysis of the long bones with the sparing of the epiphysis. The monostotic form, which represents 85% of cases, involves the femur in about 30 to 40% of cases. Like we see in this case, note that the lesion is sparing the epiphysis. Also, the tibia is involved in about 20% of cases, like in this case. Again, the lesion is sparing the epiphysis. Also, the skull and facial bones are involved in 10 to 25% of cases, as in this case, we can see the skull base involved in addition to other bones of the skull. 10% of cases are in the ribs, as in this case with right rib involvement. Rarely it is seen in the hands, feet, and spine. Polystotic form, which represents 15% of cases, involves the skull and facial bones in more than 50% of cases. Also the pelvis, the long bones, the ribs, and it's usually unilateral or monomeric, which means it involves one limb. Osteofibrous dysplasia involves the tibia in more than 90% and the fibula in 15% of cases. As you can see in this case, with large osteofibrous dysplasia of the tibia, the size of the lesion varies from 1 to 30 cm. The lesion appears as an expansile lytic medullary in morphology. Regarding plain radiography, it's the best diagnostic tool in this pathology. The lesions of fibrous dysplasia are seen as a radiolucent expansile medullary lesion with ground glass appearance due to the woven bone in the bone marrow cavity. They have a well-defined sclerotic margin with industrial scalloping and no periosteitis or periosteal reaction. Bowing deformities of long bones, or so-called shepherd's crook deformity, are seen like in this case, in which there is bilateral radiolucent expensile medullary lesions with a ground glass appearance, sparing the epiphysis with bilateral shepherd's crook deformity. In craniofacial involvement, we see mixed lytic and sclerotic lesions, in which there will be sclerosis in the lesions involving the skull base and expanded calvarium with greater involvement of the outer table, also frontal bossing and facial asymmetry. Like in this case, in which we can see mixed lytic and sclerotic lesions with sclerosis in the lesions involving the skull base and expanded calvaria with a greater involvement of the outer tear. Another example showing the skull base involvement as a sclerotic lesion with main involvement of the outer table of the skull seen at the posterior aspect of the skull. In this example, we can see the frontal bossing with sclerotic expansion of the frontal bone involving mainly the outer table of the skull and sclerotic changes of the skull base. In osteofibrous dysplasia, we see a lytic lesion in the anterior cortex of the tibial diaphysis and may involve the medullary cavity, also bowing pathologic fractures and pseudoarthrosis can be seen. Like in this case of osteofibrous dysplasia, we can see a lytic lesion in the anterior cortex of the tibial diaphysis with bowing of the tibia. In CT scan, we will see a non-mineralized matrix with density of 70 to 400 Hounsfield unit due to microscopic calcification, but there are no soft tissue masses. CT is helpful in evaluating skull lesions and after contrast injection, we will see enhancement of active lesions, like in this example we see a non-mineralized matrix with density between 70 to 400 Hausfeld units due to microscopic calcification, but note that there are no soft tissue masses. Another example showing clearly the woven bone or cotton wool bone with bony expansion and no soft tissue masses. In MRI on T1-weighted imaging, we will see homogeneous low signal with thin rim of low signal lesion 
while on T2 weighted imaging there will be high signal in 60% of cases also mixed signal intensity can be seen with thin rim of low signal intensity and after contrast injection there will be enhancement of the active lesions like in this case we can see on T1-weighted imaging that there is a homogeneous low-signal lesion with thin rim of low signal involving almost the entire tibia sparing the epiphysis, while on T2-weighted imaging there is a high to mixed signal intensity and a thin rim of low signal. And after contrast injection, there is enhancement of the lesion suggesting active lesion. Another example on this T1-weighted image, in this patient with fibrous dysplasia and shepherd's crook deformity with pathologic fracture of the femoral neck, we can see the lesion showing homogeneous low signal with thin rim of low signal. In a nuclear medicine, bone scan is done to determine the activity and the extent of involvement because there will be increased uptake in the majority of lesions. Decreased activity implies that the lesion has become inactive. Like in this bone scan, showing increased activity in this polystotic monomelic case of fibrous dysplasia. The tibia, the femur, and the left bony pelvis are involved. So what's the differential diagnosis in cases of fibrous dysplasia? Well, the list here includes neurofibromatosis, Paget's disease, unicameral bone cyst, chondromyxoid fibroma, aneurysmal bone cyst, and adamantinoma. Regarding neurofibromatosis, the long bones deformity are not associated with intramedullary changes, while pseudoarthrosis has a poor prognosis. Note that pseudoarthrosis in fibrous dysplasia has a good therapeutic response. Like in this case, we can see that the medullary cavity is not affected, as we saw in the cases of fibrous dysplasia, and the pseudoarthrosis is also seen in this resort radial bone. Three examples of bowing with cortical thickening in patients with a neurofibromatosis. In all of them, the medullary cavity is preserved. In Paget's disease, the calvarial expansion involves both inner and outer tables of the skull, while there is greater involvement of the outer table in cases of fibrous dysplasia. Like in this case, the calvarial expansion here involves the inner and outer table and we can see the cotton wool appearance like in fibrous dysplasia, but the involvement of both tables of the skull is a feature of Paget's disease. Another example showing the involvement of the inner and outer tables of the skull in this patient with Paget's disease. In unicameral bone cyst, the lesion is centrally located. Also, we see fallen fragment sign in cases of fracture. Like in this case, we can see a centrally located lesion not involving the cortex with a pathologic fracture. Another example showing a centrally located lesion not involving the cortex with a pathologic fracture and clearly demonstrating the fallen fragment sign. Chondromyxoid fibroma will demonstrate geographic pattern of bone destruction and periosteal newborn formation, which is not seen in fibrous dysplasia. Like in this case of chondromyxoid fibroma, showing a geographic pattern of bone destruction and periosteal newborn formation, which is not seen in fibrous dysplasia. Another example of chondromyxoid fibroma showing a geographic pattern of bone destruction and periosteal newborn formation. Regarding aneurysmal bone cyst, there will be marked expansion of the affected bone with fluid fluid levels. Like in this aneurysmal bone cyst, you can see the marked expansion of the affected bone. Another example of this T2-weighted axial image showing marked body expansion with multiple fluid fluid levels consistent with aneurysmal bone cyst. Adamantinoma is seen in older patients. It is eccentrically located, while osteofibrous dysplasia involves the anterior tibial cortex. Also, adamantinoma has destructive features. Like in this example of adamantinoma, we can see the closed growth plates indicating the patient is an adult. The lesion is eccentrically located and has a destructive pattern. Again, in this patient, X-ray and CT scan of adamantinoma showing an extrinsic lesion with a more destructive pattern of bone involvement. Well, this was all for today's episode. At the end, I just want to remind you to subscribe, like, share, and tell your friends about us. If you have any comments, write them in the comment section. See you next Friday at 5 p.m. This is Dr. Ahmad Baya Abdul and this is Highlights in Radiology Season 2. Bye.